was a moment when the lights went out and death had claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life. Darkest day in history And on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atones and Final breath and it was finished And not the end we might have known for the earth, for the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. The sacrifice was made, and the heavens
Well, welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us online today at the Vineyard Church Bloomington Normal. My name is Corey Waters, and I am one of the pastors here, and we just want to say welcome. Hey, would you do us a favor and check in on Facebook and let us know that you're joining us online today? Or, better yet, you can even share our online services so people know uh, what you're up to this Sunday. We would love for you to do that. People are still looking for a place to connect uh, during this time, and so... Uh, if you love us that much, we would love for you to share us that much. So go ahead and do that. Um, I have a couple announcements this morning uh, before we get into the meat of our service. Uh, the first thing is, is that we're going to be talking about uh, our increased worship night that's coming up on Sunday night, October 25th, and that's at 6 p.m. here, live and in person. If you would love to join us, we would love to have you. Uh, we will do our best to stay socially distanced that night. Uh, we do not have child care. So if you have younger kids um, and you want to bring them along, we would love for them to join us with worship that night. I know that our little kids love to hang out while we worship in church. Uh, they love to experience the Holy Spirit just as much as we do. And so bring them along. But don't miss out on that night, the 25th Sunday. That's actually next Sunday, the 25th. Don't miss out, 6 p.m. All right, the next thing we have coming up is I know that we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks is our Thanksgiving food box outreach. That is not too far away, guys. I know we think, oh, it's just October, not a big deal, but it really is. November is going to be here before you know it. And currently, we are taking signups for people to volunteer, to donate items, or to donate money for the items that we need to purchase and order ahead of time to make sure that all of our boxes are full so that we can bless other people. And I, you know, I had an update this week that we are already almost at our 225 boxes confirmed. We have over 190 people already that are expecting boxes from our church. And that's amazing. That's just been one week since we've reached out to local agencies and schools. Um, and they have put us in touch with all these families. And we have that many people confirmed. It's pretty crazy. We know that there's a huge need right now in our community. So I want to encourage you to go online to our Facebook page and you can find the links there to sign up to either volunteer, to donate money, or to donate items. And you can donate those items and bring them into the building when you have them. We're open during the week. Um, our offices are closed on Fridays. Uh, but you can come up to the office anytime, Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 2, and drop off your items and do it that way if you would like to. Um, uh, just because we are going to start collecting those items soon. And if you have any questions about our, uh, our Thanksgiving food box outreach, please reach out to our outreach pastors, Andy and Lauren Hegg. You can uh, connect with Lauren on the email that's listed below. It's outreach at vineyardbloomington.com. She, uh, she will reach back out to you. She will give you the information you need. And we also just want to encourage people that if you know of somebody within our Bloomington Normal community that is in need this season of any kind of extra food for the holidays, please let us know and let Lauren know that she can reach out to them personally. All right, that was a lot of information, but it was so exciting to be able to share with you how many boxes we already have spoken for. So with that, we're gonna actually talk about uh, giving right now. And, and we know that as we approach uh, the fall season and the holiday season, that there are some families that are going to be in need. And so we have the opportunity that you can give to our holiday offerings even right now before the holidays even hit so that we can bless people within our church community and outside the walls. But we also want to say thank you so much for continuing to give during this season and during this time. We are so blessed uh, by what you have done um, that we are able to still continue and move forward in the way that we've been doing, whether we're alive or online. Uh, the church is still moving, the church is still on the ground, and we are, um, I want to say, kicking butt and taking names. I don't know, that's not really appropriate, but that's what we're doing here. <laughs> and we're so thankful for all of you people that have given um, during um, the last couple months in the last couple years. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then I'll explain to you how you can give. Jesus, we just thank you uh, for the men and women that are watching with us online. We thank you so much, Father, for their hearts, for the community. We thank you so much um, for their hearts just in general, God, and how much they love you. And we just want to say um, that we just love them for everything that they've done for our church. And Father, I just pray a blessing over them right now, over their finances, over their family life. God, I just pray that they will receive the blessings that you have for them. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You can go to our website, vineyardbloomington.com, and you can click the Give button. You can give right now, or you can always mail a check uh, as well. You can find the information for our mailing address on our, on our website as well. So I'm going to drive you to the website like crazy because that is where all the information is for everything I talked about today. So don't miss out on that. All right. Well, I hope you guys have really enjoyed the last four weeks of No Filter and that you guys really enjoyed Andy's message last week. Um, we had some great small group discussion this past week about his sermon and the crazy things that our teachers did and how we interacted with them, but how it actually, sometimes we take scripture and we put a different filter on them than what God's actually talking to us about. And sometimes we maybe have to change our filters just to see uh, how the Holy Spirit is leading us through a certain piece of text in, in the Bible. So I hope that you guys uh, experienced that, that, week, that last week as well. Uh, this week, I get the privilege of introducing week five, and Adam is actually going to bring the next uh, message for No Filter. So if you guys will welcome him to the stage, he'll kick it off. played sports growing up, uh, wherever you're watching, whatever city you're in, whatever couch you're sitting on, whatever device you're watching on, uh, you know, many, many, many of us played sports or did extracurricular activities as young kids. I know that many of us didn't become college athletes or professional athletes or any of those things, but many of us played an extracurricular sport or did an extracurricular activity when we were growing up. Um, I'm betting almost everyone who's watching this right now was involved in something. Uh, I was personally involved in baseball and basketball mostly. Those were the, the peewee sports that I played. Uh, but you might have done peewee football, you might have done uh, little league uh, baseball, you might have done soccer, you might have been in band, you might have been in, you might have been in. Now, do you remember anybody that was a super intense competitor? when you were in one of those sports, one of those activities. Maybe you were like me and you were that intense competitor, always wanting to win, always striving for things that were greater, pushing harder and harder to win the game. Uh, do you remember any intense parents when you were a kid? Do you remember any parents that were so over the top intense, they always wanted their kids to do the best, to be the best, to always win the game? Maybe they screamed at their kids a lot, yelled at their kids off the field or off the court or off of the, the stage, depending on what they were doing. Do you remember any really, really intense parents that only cared with the success of their child? Maybe only cared if their kid won. Uh, and in fact, it really actually didn't matter if they won the game, but what really mattered was did their kid play well? They were so intense that they would even get angry if they won the game, but their kid played bad. Do you remember any parents like that? When I was a young man, these were called little league dads. That's what we called them. We called them little league dads. You have a little league dad? Did you have a little league dad? Are you now a little league dad? But here's the thing. They, they weren't always dads. Sometimes it's a mom. It's a little intense. In fact, um, one of our staff this week told me, and y'all figure out which staff this was, they said that dance moms are the worst. That was her response to this sermon. Do you remember somebody that was so intense it actually made you uncomfortable about the way that they were treating their kid? A few years ago, Zeke was playing football, and I remember one of the moms and one of the quarterbacks, she was so intense and so irate and got so just raw about what was happening in the football game, was yelling at the refs and the coaches and everybody so bad that they actually had to remove her from the stands. Some of her family, um, some of the officials had to come up and actually take her away. They wouldn't let her watch the rest of the game. She was so intense. Can you remember a baseball dad, a football mom, a dance mom? Can you remember a parent who tore their kids a new one because their grades were bad? 
Maybe that was your experience growing up. Maybe that was your parents themselves. I, I don't know. But why were they like that? Why did those parents get so intense with their children, so intense with the competition, so intense with the extracurricular activity? I think it's because they didn't understand what unconditional love was really about. They didn't understand what unconditional love really looks like. I would go as far as to say that it was about control. It was about controlling the situation. It was about controlling their child or that person. Let me try and explain. Um, I, I'm a parent of five children. And I gotta tell you that we were a lot more controlling with our firstborn than we were with our fourth and fifth born when they were born. In fact, you might have noticed that. Whether you're a first time parent, a single parent, or you're about to be a parent, you might find yourself trying to control the situation of your child. What they eat, what they drink, what they wear, the way that they act, do they embarrass me or not embarrass me in public? Most of the time when we have a first child or we're expecting a first child or we have an only child, the parents really struggle with this idea of, can I control this one individual? You might have seen a seasoned mom or a seasoned dad who has two, three, four kids. You know, they realize after the first one, oh my gosh, I can't control a single thing. That's a little human being. As a little human being is going to make their own decisions. Now I can train and guide and try and raise them up with certain morals and manners, but I can't actually control them. They're another human being. And that's a revelatory thing. I hope nobody's like glass is shattering right now as you're hearing this from me. If you only got one child or you're expecting your first child or something like that. But it's a little human being and you can't control them. You, you can't control the way they act in public. You can encourage and guide and Sometimes you need to let them throw that tantrum. But we can't control someone else. And what I think happens in those little league dads is we see the bad example of what control looks like over another human being. Now, most of the time, it's not overt like that, overt aggression like a little league dad or a dance mom. Most of the time, it's much more subtle. Most of the time, it's a little more passive aggressive in the way that people try and control other people, try and control the situation, try and manage somebody else's life. Now, when Jesus walked into his ministry, when he walked in into his ministry, there was this group of people that were supposed to be parenting well the Israelite community. There was this group of people that were supposed to be parenting the Jewish people into the fullness of following after God. You see, the Roman government wasn't allowing kings anymore. Kings weren't going to happen. They were putting up their governmental structures on top of the Jewish religious system. So the Jewish religious systems were the, the rulers of the day, controlling and organizing uh, the community and the politics and the way the Jewish people interacted because the kings, the Caesars, were ruling over the people. So the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, were an interesting group. They were a group that their design was to be leading God's people and to be parenting God's people. We would call it mothering and fathering God's people, parenting God's people into following and encountering God himself. And there were several sects of leaders that Jesus had to interact with. I'd love to get into a, a conversation about why there were all these different sects uh, of, of leaders, but it's not important for us today. What's important for us today is realize there's a lot of them. Pharisees, Sadducees, religious leaders, high priests, lower priests, zealots, Essenes. There's all kinds of names. We're not going to get into all of that. What's important is that God wanted all of these groups to have a specific role. to lead people towards him. They were to parent them through using the religious texts of the law and the prophets, the law of Moses, the prophets of the Old Testament. Use the things that God had said through these important people to show them who he was. Uh, a God who loved them and wanted relationship with them. They were supposed to be parenting the Jewish people into relationship with God. He wanted them to father and mother them, to parent them not to control them. He didn't want the religious leaders to control everything. He wanted them to parent them into relationship with God. So John the Baptist in Matthew chapter three 
breaks the ice on confronting this group of people with, you're not parenting, you're not doing what God has asked you to do. And he actually calls them a brood of vipers. He calls them snakes, everybody. Seriously, Matthew 3, you look it up if you don't believe me. And Matthew 3 actually calls them snakes. That the things that they had done and the direction they'd taken the Jewish people had gone so far out of the realm of relationship with God and into control that they missed the point. See, they thought that they could control God's people into following God. And that doesn't work. See, love is not control. Love is not control. Love is giving people a choice. Love is not controlling people's actions and attitudes. It's giving people a choice to follow or not to follow. It's giving people a choice to love or not to love. It's not binding them into a certain box, but it's freeing them up to make the right choice. Just like it is in parenting. Now, we've consistently gotten this wrong, I think, as humans. We've consistently missed the point on what it means to not control, but to give people choice. Let me show you how we do those two things on a regular basis. See, love's not control. Love is giving people a choice. But we believe a couple of things. We believe probably one of two things, but, uh, and there's, there might be others, but I want to focus in on these two this weekend, specifically one of them. But there are two things that we really believe as human beings that seems to mess up that idea of love not being controlled, but giving people a choice. The first thing that a lot of us believe is we believe that God controls everything that happens. That's a dangerous thing to believe, actually. It's a dangerous thing to believe that God controls everything that happens because what it does is it, advocate, it advocates our responsibility off of us and puts it all back on God. In fact, I know many Christians who use this as an excuse or as a crutch in their belief system that God controls everything, so I don't have a say in it anyway. And it actually allows us to believe that God's a bad person and not a good person if he controls everything. I'll unpack that here in just a second, because I want to get into the second thing that we believe, too. A lot of people, that what, what, what is hard for us is a belief system, and the thing that gets it wrong is that we believe that God controls everything that happens. The other thing that we sometimes believe is we believe that we can control everything that happens. And that's what the religious leaders believe. It's actually what a lot of people believe in our world right now. You see people trying to control people on social media, don't you? What they believe about social issues, what they believe about political issues, what they believe about religious issues, and we know that it doesn't work. So the two things that trip us up is that we either believe that God controls everything that happens, or we believe that we can control everything that happens. Now I'm going to spend most of my time on that second part, because it really pertains to the religious leaders and their belief that they can control everything that happens. But before we do, I want, to, I want to spend a little bit more time on that first thing, that we can, some of us believe that God controls everything that happens. And our text this weekend is Matthew 23. So if you have your Bible, have your iPad, have your iPhone, however you read the scriptures, um, I would I encourage you to open it up this weekend to Matthew 23, because I'm going to pick and choose a few scriptures to point out, but the whole chapter is good for us. And what I love about Matthew 23 is that Jesus actually addresses both of these things. He addresses first our want to control everything. And he addresses, second, the belief that God controls everything that happens. But I want to look at God controlling everything that happens first. And I love that Jesus actually tells us that's not true at the end of Matthew 23. So if I'm going to shatter your paradigm on that one, I'm sorry, but this is a good thing for us to know. Matthew 23, the very end of the chapter, says this in verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often, I can hear Jesus pleading here, can't you? How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her children beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. I love this verse. This verse is so important for those of us that struggle with the fact that we believe that God controls everything that happens. First, it shows us that if we make bad choices, God still loves us. I mean, listen to this. Jerusalem, the city that I love, you're the city that killed the prophets and stoned my messengers. And yet, that doesn't stop God from loving them, from wanting to be in a relationship with them. It doesn't stop God from wanting to be near them and protect them. Even though they've made bad choices in the past, it doesn't mean that his love has stopped for them. That's so important for us. 
Even when we make bad choices, God still loves us. Second, this verse shows us this, that God has dreams and plans for us, but he won't force his will on our choices. God has dreams and plans for us, but he won't force his will on our choices. I want to gather you as a chick or as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I wanted to do that. I have a dream for you. I have protection for you. I have love and hope and destiny for you. I have them for you, but I won't force it on you. That would be control. And I want to give you a choice. That's love. Third, it shows us in this verse that we have the power to choose or to deny God's plans. I wanted to protect you. I wanted to get you. I wanted to love you in spite of your past. And yet, you wouldn't let me, the text says. Think about that for a second. God is not going to control our choices. We have the, the, the power to choose his plan or deny his plan. We can envelop ourselves in what he wants for us, or we can say no to us. He says, you wouldn't let me. You know, that tells us that God is not controlling us. It tells us that he's not controlling everything that happens, that we have a role to play. We have a role to play because love is not control. Love is giving us a choice. And God is love. He's not here to control us. He's here to give us choices. You see, and Jesus knew this. Jesus knew this when he walked into his conversations with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the priests, the Essenes, the, all of the groups. When he walked into the, the conversation with them, he knew that they believed they could control. They believed that God would control. But he knew that he was a loving God who wouldn't control them. He would love them and care about them. And he would want to draw them to himself. I think that's why he got so frustrated with the religious people. He got so frustrated with the religious people because he was giving them a choice and they were giving no one else a choice. He knew this fact more than anything else. He knew that religion was control. Love was choice. Religion was control. And he wanted the Jewish leaders to see this. Your job is to father my people. Father my people in their relationship with me. Father them towards God. Don't control them, their actions, their attitudes, their words, their voices. So he steps into the scene and immediately there's confusion. Because the people, the, the common people were seeing Jesus and like, he speaks with authority because of his power, because of his love, and because he's given us choice. Man, there's so much authority in what he does. And yet our religious leaders, they're exercising their power to get control, not to love us. They wanted, the Jewish leaders, they wanted to push their power so that they could gain control. That's a dangerous place to be when you're over a group of people. They didn't want to father them in love. They wanted to control. You see, they had a system of beliefs that was all messed up. The Israelites had been exiled, right? Imprisoned, overthrown, ruler after ruler over the top of them over and over and over again. And the religious leaders had this belief system. This belief system that if we can control our actions, God will love us. If we can control the things that we do and the purity that we have, God will love us. And that's so not God. If we can control the people, maybe God will love us. If we can control their actions, maybe God will love us. But it wasn't about the impurity of their actions. It was about the impurity of their hearts, the inner being of who they were. And Jesus understood that, and the religious leaders did not. See, Jesus was coming to show them it wasn't about the actions that you've done. It was about love. Do you love God with everything that you have? Not do you perform a certain ceremony, but do you love God with everything that you have? See, they believed that we can control everything. That human beings could control everything. So they were doing their best to control God's people because they said, you don't need choices, you need to do this. 
But the problem is when you remove choice, you remove love. And all you're left with is religion. Here's their thought process. Why don't we control God's people so that God doesn't punish us? That's wrong thinking. Why don't we control God's people so that we can have positions of power? Why don't we control God's people so that our actions of control can be validated by, look at how good we are, look at how smart we are, look at how much better we are. We'll feel better about ourselves if we can get them under our feet. But it wasn't fathering the community, it was controlling the family. And Jesus comes to them in Matthew 23, and he's at the end of his time, and he's getting very frustrated the end of his time on earth, it's right before the cross, and he's getting very frustrated with the way they've been controlling God's people. It says this in Matthew 23. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, he's not even addressing the Pharisees, he says, to the crowds of people that are following him and to his disciples, his specific followers, he says this, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. I love how Jesus starts this chapter, right? Addressing the crowds, addressing his followers. I love what the religious leaders are trying to teach you. I love that they're trying to teach you the law of God. I love that they're trying to teach you the stories of God. I love that they're trying to teach you my prophetic heart for you. I love that they're trying to teach you all the messages of the Old Testament. That stuff is good. They're seated where Moses was seated in that same kind of place as authority over you. And they're giving you stuff that I wanted you to hear. There are things in there that can point you to the Father. And you can know the Father in heaven if you listen to what they, what they have in those teachings. Like, like a baseball dad. They have the ability to teach you baseball. Or like a, a parent trying to teach their child how to walk or how to run. They have the ability to teach you how to do those simple things. They have the ability to teach you the things you're supposed to learn. But there's something wrong in the way they're doing it. It's not fathering, it's control. Listen to the next verse. So practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow the example. Don't do what they're doing. For they don't practice what they teach. In fact, you might know that, right? Do what I say, don't do what I do. Maybe you've heard that before. They don't practice what they preach. They don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and they never lift a finger to ease the burden of the control they placed on you. See, they're not acting like good parents trying to lead them towards the Father's love. They're not trying to train you up to follow God with your whole heart. They're not loving you. They're trying to control you. Can you hear Jesus' heart? They're not trying to teach you the nature of who God is. They're trying to teach you the nature of their religious practices. They're not concerned with what your heart is doing and how your heart is responding to God. They're only concerned with the actions that you perform in order to follow what they want you to follow. They're not giving you a choice. They're trying to make you perfect in their eyes. In fact, in 2323, a famous verse that says, you should tie yes, but don't neglect mercy, faith, and justice. Yes, you should tie. That's something they can teach you. That's a good practice. But don't just do those things. Practice the good things of your heart. Things like justice and mercy and faith. See, Jesus calls them hypocrites over and over and over again in Matthew 23. This is like the first mention of that word in the history of the world that we know of. Is this hypocritical idea comes from these religious leaders that Jesus is so frustrated with. He says, you're only letting your people that you're leading see part of the picture. You're not letting them see the whole picture of who God really is. See, they weren't actually trying to get people to love the Father any longer. They were trying to dominate and domineer people's lives in ways that were so controlling and so frustrating to God's people that they weren't actually being led towards the Father. So Jesus gets real up front with them after he starts this, this discourse on not following their example. And I don't have time to unpack this whole chapter. We could spend weeks on it. 
But he gets real forceful with them at this point. It's like his final appeal. He's like, would you make the choice to change the way you're doing things? Would you make the choice to, to follow the people? Would you make the choice to follow me instead of following your religious ideas? And he gets super upset with them because he knows love is not control. Love is giving people a choice. And he's trying to give them a choice. But he's so frustrated that he almost uh, he, he bubbles over with, would you understand what you're doing? Listen to some of the things he says about them. He says, it's not about what you wear. It changes your heart. He spends verses 5 through 7 talking about, it's not about what you wear that changes your heart. It's not about if you wear a suit to church or shorts and a t-shirt to church. It doesn't matter what you wear to temple. It doesn't matter if you're dressed really nice or dressed really poorly. It matters what's going on in your heart. He says things like, it's not about the tithes. Or excuse me, not about the titles. It's not whether you call people rabbi or teacher or father. In fact, sometimes that still happens in our churches where people call people father or call people reverend or call people minister or whatever it is. It's not about what you call people, but it's about humble leadership, serving the people and leading them and showing them the father. He says it's not about the temple. It's not about where you worship. It's not about the church that you're in, whether it has a steeple or a cross or what kind of building it is, whether you're inside or outside. It doesn't matter where you worship. It's about the one that we worship, religious leaders. It's not about the religious ceremonies that you do. And we still have some of those that sometimes maybe can feel like it's oppressive religion, be it the way we take communion or the way that we do baptism or the way that we give. It's not about the religious ceremonies that you do. That's not going to change anything. But it's about your heart being pure before God when you do those things. You're doing it as an act of love, not an act of religion. He said it's not about your religious pedigree. What line did you come from? They were really big on that one. What part of the Levitical line did they come from? What part of the Jewish line did they come from? And, and it wasn't about that. And it's not about, in our context, it's not about the pastor or the priest or the heritage or, or, or which church you're a part of. It's not about that. It's about actually taking the words that those people teach us and applying them to our lives. It's not about all the things on the outside. It's about a change in heart on the inside. And he was begging and pleading with the religious leaders, don't be this way. Don't control the people because you're leading them further away from me instead of further towards me. You're not giving them a choice to love me. You're giving them a way to be controlled. I think at this point in my message, it might be a good time for me to apologize. It might be a good time for me to apologize to you. You see, I want to apologize on behalf of all the religious leaders that there's been throughout the centuries, over the last couple of thousand years. It wasn't just the religious leaders of Jesus' day that screwed up. Sometimes it was people after that continued to push this idea of organized religion, which is control of your life, instead of giving you a choice to follow the loving Father. And I want to apologize on behalf of all the religious leaders who have done things in the name of God that weren't God's heart for you. Think about, there are some atrocious examples in history of how religious leaders have done things to control other people, whether it be the Crusades, where they went and killed Muslims, or whether it was the Inquisition, when they would try and torture people to make them followers of God. Or maybe it was just hypocritical actions like the way that children and women have been treated throughout the centuries by religious leaders. I want to apologize on their behalf. It's not right. It's not God's heart for you. It's not always those big overt examples like the crusade. Sometimes it's a little more subtle. Maybe you've experienced a different kind of abuse from a religious leader that women haven't been made equal with men that people of color haven't been made equal with those of us that are Caucasians maybe it's that children should be seen and not heard or maybe that they've been talked about or treated in a way they should never have been treated by a religious leader 
Maybe it's the manipulation of emotion to try and get you to do something or give something. Maybe it's the appearance of holiness on a religious leader when their life's a mess and they're not transparent and real with you about their struggles. Maybe it's even believing there's only one path to find Jesus when there might be multiple ways for you to find Jesus. Maybe the Holy Spirit met you and then you got baptized instead of I have to say a certain prayer, get baptized a certain way, do a certain thing. Those religious actions are all controlled. They're not choice and love. See, the church has gotten this wrong over and over and over again for so many people and for so many moments in history. Today, I want to personally apologize for any hypocrisy, any religious control that you experienced. See, love is not control. Love is giving you a choice to find our Father who loves us. See, you have the power to choose or to reject Jesus. He's given it to you. He longs to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you have to let him. He won't force it upon you. And that's unconditional love, friends. See, forcing religion on somebody else isn't right. It's not love. See, healthy churches, healthy congregations, healthy bodies of believers actually allow you to disagree, to have questions, to have doubts, and still have a relationship with the church. Because our job is not to control, it's to give you a choice to love or not to love Jesus. But I don't want to end with just an apology. I think there's one more thing we should talk about. There's really one more thing we need to do before we, we close with what we're going to do today. And that is, some of us need to take the throat, or excuse me, some of us need to take our feet off the throat of our leaders. You know what I mean when I say that? When you put somebody under your feet, you put your, your foot on their throat and you hold them down. Some of, some of us need to take our, our feet off the throat of maybe our current leaders or our past religious leaders, our past pastors or priests or whoever has tried to grow you up in your face. Some of us need to remove that foot off the throat of those people. See, we need to forgive too. We need to forgive too for those who have hurt us through their hypocrisy or control. We need to realize that they're human. There's a humanity in your church leaders. We need to realize they're on a journey towards Jesus just like we are, and they're not finished yet. We need to realize that sometimes they make bad choices, and that's what I was apologizing for. But we don't need to make the further bad choice of holding them down underneath that bad choice. See, we need to let go of someone for not being perfect. Just like the religious leaders need to let go of the people of Jesus' day for not being perfect. We don't need to throw a fit and unfriend everybody that disagrees with us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You see, this isn't just about church leaders. It's sometimes about the control that we hold on to tightly I would call those grudges. See, when we hold on to offense over someone else, and essentially we're trying to hold our control over a past situation that we need to let go of. When we hold on to offense, it actually hurts us more than it hurts the other person. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 12. Work at living at peace with everyone. And work at live a holy life. For those who are not holy, don't get to see God very much. See, we need to look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace that God has for us. I love this last part. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you and then corrupts others as well, corrupts many. Watch out that, that you don't hold on to an offense so long, a grudge so long, control over their life and their feelings and their emotions over your own life so long, that it actually hurts you and it actually hurts those around you. We need to take our feet off the throat of those that hurt us too. We need to stop trying to control them. See, we need to forgive so that we're free. 
We need to forgive so that we don't need to control. We need to forgive so that we're free of the burden of controlling someone else. And you might think, well, that'll, that'll take place as I, over time. But here's the problem with time. We, we have that old phrase. It's not biblical. The time heals all wounds. But time won't heal all those wounds if bitterness is growing up on you. Time won't heal those wounds if that bitterness is taking root in you. In fact, if you let bitterness grow in you over time, it actually makes it worse. If you're not willing to let them go, it's actually going to compound the situation. See, love means choice, not control. Love means that sometimes we have to allow somebody else to do something that we don't like. So I thought we'd end this way this week. I thought we would get a, get a glimpse of what this looks like from Jesus' standpoint. I thought we'd give all of you a choice. We're going to end by taking communion. We're going to end by taking communion. Or not. That's the whole point of this. Is you don't have to do what I'm going to encourage many of you to do in this moment. You have the choice to take communion or not take communion. I've got a, a little cup and cracker here that I'm going to take this out of. If you're at home, I'm going to give you some space here in just a little bit where you can go to your kitchen or grab a you know, glass of water and a cracker is fine. It can be a cup of coffee and a donut. It can be anything. It's one thing to represent the body, one thing to represent the blood of Jesus. And you have a choice in this moment to take communion or not. You see, Jesus stepped into this idea of communion. It was something that was so deeply religious that he thought, I've got to go inside of that thing and turn it on its head and, and undo it from the inside out. See, the Passover ceremony was a, a celebration of what had happened to them in Egypt. They had been saved. They, they received salvation from the Egyptian oppressors. They had been saved through the plagues and through the Red Sea. They had been saved and set free. And they were being released to go and follow and worship God. Salvation came to them as they left Egypt. But in Jesus' day, the Passover had become a religious ceremony. It had become a list of things to do and not do. It was no longer about celebrating the love of our Father in Heaven who had released them from captivity. It was about doing everything just right. The type of land that you had, the type of things that you ate, the type of people that were around you, and the things that you did in order to accomplish the Passover. And Jesus said, I've got to undo that because it doesn't show people the Father anymore. So he stepped into it at the cross. And he died for our sins, for you and for me, for all who come after us who place their faith in Jesus. He stepped into it at the cross and said, I'm going to remake the Passover. I'm going to remake the Passover. Let's try this again, everybody. Let's, let's see the point of this celebration. It's about salvation. And not just a one-time salvation from Egypt. Now it's a salvation for all eternity through my blood, not just through the blood of that man. See, Jesus said, I love you. And I'm choosing you at the cross. I'm choosing you at my death, my burial, my resurrection. I'm choosing to do this for you. I'm choosing to set you free. But I'm not going to make you choose me. You have to do that on your own. I want to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and love you. But you've got to want it too. See, when we take communion, when we take that simple cracker to remember Jesus' broken body, we drink that juice to celebrate Jesus' shed blood for us, we're saying, I choose you, Jesus. I choose that your body was broken for me. I choose that your blood was shed for me. I believe that. I'm placing my faith in you. He's never going to make us take communion. He's never going to make us believe, but he offers the choice because he loves you. And love isn't control. It's a choice to say yes or to say no. So here's what I would encourage you to do in these last few minutes of the service. We're going to worship through a song. It's about the cross of Jesus Christ. As we worship through this song about the cross of Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to get something to remember him by. I'm not in your living room. I'm not there physically with you. In fact, we weren't going to make anybody that's here physically in the room this weekend do this. They're going to have to choose to go and grab the cracker and the juice. And I would encourage you through this last song, 
Go find the cracker. Go find the juice. And choose Jesus. But know that I can't control you. Know that Jesus won't ever make you. But he longs to love you. He's chosen you. Will you choose him? Father, you're an amazing God. And what's so amazing about you, God, is that you don't want to control us. You want to love us. And love is a choice to follow or not to follow. And I'm so grateful, God, that I've seen your choice to love me. I'm so grateful, Jesus, that I've seen your choice to love me. I'm so grateful, Holy Spirit, that I've seen your choice to come and live inside me, to empower me to live this life. And I pray, God, with all that's within me, that some that are watching live, some that are watching online, some that will watch months from now when they see this video, will make that choice for the first time, or make that choice for the hundredth time, to say yes to you, Jesus, because you said yes to them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you go and find some communion if you're so willing this weekend while we sing this last song? Sing the cross. In the cross has the final word. In the cross has the final word. Sorrow may come. The sorrow may come. The darkest night. But the cross has the final word. In the cross.
So I really hope that you guys enjoyed Adam's sermon today and that maybe you had a perspective change in how we need to approach uh, just people in our lives and relationships in our lives and, and approach forgiveness and approach all the things that God is leading us to, the Holy Spirit is showing us during this series, and sometimes how our filter just needs to change when we look at the life of Jesus and how he handled relationships. And so I just really hope that you you heard that this morning. And so if you would like prayer and, and you just have some things going on in your lives and relationships in your lives that you need prayer about, reach out in our chat and somebody will reach back out to you and pray with you, even via text or over phone or however you need it. We'll make sure that you are getting cared for through prayer. So don't miss out on the opportunity because there's healing for that. And the Holy Spirit wants to do that this weekend. Also, don't miss out next week as I get to continue week six of No Filter. That's right. I get to preach next weekend. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about Jesus and, the, and how he interacted with his family. And I know that there's lots of different things that you see in scripture with Jesus and how he interacts with his moms and his brothers. And so I'm just really excited to unwrap how we get to carry out what Adam talked about this week in relationships into our family relationships next week. So don't miss it.